I'm here with Stephen Munitones, the founder of the World Open Water Swimming Association, or WOWZA, and marathon swimming historian. We are just days away from the Tokyo Olympic Games. So today we're doing a competitive overview of the Olympic 10K marathon swim in Adaiba Marine Park in Tokyo Bay, taking place August 4th and 5th. Uh, welcome, Stephen. Thank you. So to kick things off, why don't you tell us a little bit about the history of open water swimming in the Olympics? So everybody is familiar with pool swimming at the Olympics, from Mark Spitz to Michael Phelps. But actually, swimming began at the Olympics in 1896 in a bay. So open water swimming has always been in the Olympics since 1896, the very first modern day Olympics. The 10K, uh, 10 kilometer course was standardized in 2008 at the Beijing Olympics. Uh, in that course, they, it was four loops of a rowing basin. Um, and then in 2012 at the London Olympics, it was held in a man-made bay near Buckingham Palace in a location called the Serpentine. And in 2016, it was held in Coca Cabana Beach, uh, one of the most famous beaches in the world, right off the shores of um, Rio de Janeiro. And now in 2020, we have the same 10 kilometer course in uh, Odaiba Marine Park, which is right in the midst of Tokyo Bay. So, Stephen, I know that you played a role in uh, the long multi-decade battle to get open water swimming in the Olympics, and it's been a real boon for our sport. Um, but you, you also have uh, something interesting, an interesting factoid about uh, how educated this population is. So tell us a little bit about uh, Olympic marathon swimmers and, and their, uh, their schooling. Yes. Um, I always say open water swimming is like the combination of wrestling, water polo, distance pool swimming, marathon swimming, and chess. Um, it requires knowledge of tactics, um, strategy, um, split second decision making. And it's interesting that many open water swimmers, many have advanced education degrees, masters and PhDs. And I'm pretty sure that uh, there have been no sport in the history of the Olympics with as many athletes in the finals as marathon swimming has who have PhDs and master's degrees. Very interesting. And, and just for the audience here, we have 25 men and 25 women competing. And why don't you tell us a little bit about how they qualified? And, and I know it can get a little complicated. So if you can just summarize how, how did these 25 people get their Olympic birth? Yeah, so the first 10, the fastest 10, were selected at the World Swimming Championships, and that was held two years ago in um, South Korea. The second 10 were selected in the secondary Olympic qualifying uh, competition that was held in Portugal. And the last five represent the five continents, the best swimmers from the five continents, that is Oceania, Africa, Asia, Europe, and the Americas. Wow, really, really interesting. So, so Stephen, unlike pool swimming, or really, you know, most competitive sports uh, at the Olympic level that really try to standardize conditions, um, open water swimming is is very impact, very much impacted by um, the venue itself and the the water quality, the water temperature. Um, tell us what to expect in Tokyo and maybe start with the very publicized uh, concern over the water, water quality. Yeah, so, um, you know, Tokyo and, and, and Tokyo environs is about a, uh, has a population of over 30 million. You know, it's estimated anywhere from 35 to 37 million people in a very densely populated area, uh, you know, we think it's the most densely populated uh, city in the world. And anybody who's actually visited Tokyo and been on the subways or trains would absolutely confirm that. So you've got tens of millions of people right at the edge of Tokyo Bay where the uh, open water swimming will be held. Well, guess what? If it rains, if it floods with uh, excessive rainwater, and guess what? This event is held right in the middle of the typhoon season. 
So it's almost guaranteed that at least a tropical storm, meaning heavy rains will come during some portion of the Olympics. When heavy rains come, it actually over, it floods the um, sewage system. So not only do you have the regular sewage, but you also have an enormous amount of rainwater that's dumped. And unfortunately, the sewage system was, was you know, created many decades ago as the population just started to boom. And so on occasion, the rainwater and the sewage overflows this, the sewage system. And therefore, the overflow goes into Odaiba Marine Park and Tokyo Bay. Now, the Japanese have known this and their engineers are working very diligently to try to keep E. coli and, and other kind of uh, harmful materials out of the bay. But in fact, it's, it's an engineering impossibility. So in the case that a typhoon or tropical storm comes in the days leading up to the uh, Tokyo Olympics, you're going to smell the venue, literally smell the venue. Um, I know that's, a, you know that's not a nice thing to think about. Um, it's even a less uh, a, a unfortunate thing to, to actually swim in, but this is for the Olympics. And athletes are going to swim there, and they're going to swim their hearts out. It's just going to be very, very murky. Now, the smell is one thing. The murkiness actually does impact the race itself. The reason why you cannot see under the water. So normally, whether you were in Beijing at the rowing basin, the Serpentine in London, or Coco Cabana Beach in Rio, you've always been able to see underwater your competitors. There is no way that anybody can see underwater their competitors. So what does that mean? That means that I expect a lot of head lifting to be done, a lot of swimming with your head up, water polo style or Johnny Weissmiller style. Um, for those athletes who are really, really good um, pool swimmers, like Gregorio Paltorini, uh, Florian Welbrock, um, and others, they're never used to raising up their heads often during a race. Everybody's going to have to do that in this race. So guess what? The sewage system of Tokyo will actually directly impact the actions and the strategies of all the athletes involved. That's really interesting. So the water quality we know is poor and that will have an impact on the smell, but it's the Olympics. So maybe not, you know, the actual race, people are there to race. They're going to race, whether it smells or it's dirty or clean uh, but the visibility will impact some of the some of the tactics used in the race. Um, that's good to know. So, Stephen, tell us about uh, the expected water temperature and the air temperature. Whew, it's going to be hot. I mean, we're talking really hot. Uh, it's interesting that a year ago, over a year ago, the uh, Tokyo Olympic Organizing Committee made a decision to move mar the marathon run from Tokyo up north to Hokkaido. So because of the heat and humidity, uh, anybody who's been in, uh, you know, the Mediterranean, uh, South Miami, uh, South Florida, um, many places in Asia, you know that in July and August, it can be hot, sticky, muggy, humid, you walk outside and your glasses fog up or you start to perspire almost immediately. Now expect those athletes will be doing the same thing with black tight compression suits on. In, in, for women, they'll go you know, above the shoulders, down to the knees, black tight compression suits, tech suits we call them. So they're already overheating and now they're enveloped in tight black as the sun is beating down on them, their core body temperatures are going to skyrocket. Now the marathon running community decided that was a little too dangerous and they moved the uh, marathon run from Tokyo way up North into Hokkaido, which is the northernmost Island in Japan in order to avoid the heat and humidity. Marathon swimmers are stuck in this murky uh, bay water 
the temperature will probably be between 30 and 31, 32 degrees Celsius. Uh, for those Americans who are more familiar with Fahrenheit, that's roughly between 86 and 88, 89 degrees Fahrenheit. It's going to be roasting. Again, this is directly impacting the speed and the tactics and the strategy of all the swimmers. Again, for those athletes who have been acclimatized to very warm water, we're talking, you almost can't get any warmer than the conditions that will be um, seen in Tokyo. Um, it will be murky. It will be hot and humid. And it will be warm. They'll be enveloped in these tight black um, fitting uh, tech suits. It's going to be rough. People are going to start getting um, hyperthermic. Hypothermic, which we usually associate with, let's say, channel swimming or marathon swimming, when your body temperature decreases and you get very cold, hyperthermia is the opposite where you get very warm and, and you're approaching heat stroke and, and different other um, uh, medical conditions. Wow, Stephen, so water temperature in the high 80s, air temperature, what do you think, in the 90s? Yes. And, um, and humid. And nearly 100% humidity. Wow. Um, you know, we're coming up on, or it actually is the typhoon season. I mean, literally, there is no more water you can place in the atmosphere during a tropical storm or a um, typhoon, especially when the air temperature and water temperature are so warm. Wow. So, Stephen, there's one other factor unique to this Olympics uh, that's going to impact a lot of, a lot of things um, as, as these athletes prepare to race a 10K, and that's some of the COVID restrictions um, in the Olympic Village, at the race site itself, in Adaiba Marine Park. Why don't you walk us through how that might impact the race? Oh, absolutely. I mean, um, without a question, there are going to be athletes, unfortunately, who either test positive or who actually get sick um, in the Olympic Village. This is a fact of life. Um, I don't believe we'll have any uh, kind of serious illness or hospitalization and, and certainly not death, uh, but we are in the midst of a global pandemic. And the Tokyo Olympic Organizing Company, uh, Committee, in cooperation with the Japanese authorities have, and the IOC, have placed very specific COVID guidelines. For example, if you test positive, you go in front of a, a a commission for each sport, and then you're judged whether you are either put in quarantine, um, put in a hospital, uh, separated from uh, your teammates or the other athletes. And that means there, will, there may be athletes through no fault of their own or because they test positive or if they get sick will actually miss the Olympics. And that's a very real possibility, especially for the athletes in the marathon swim, which is in the second week of uh, the Olympics. First week, athletes are still getting there, but the second week, I think the probability of testing positive, and remember, even if you don't test positive, but you have close contact, meaning you're within two meters of, let's say, another athlete, a coach, an administrator, official, a referee, then you are deemed also um, uh, someone who should be quarantined. And imagine, just imagine the case that um, a teammate or uh, someone you have eaten, eating in the, in, in the Olympic Village uh, dining hall or someone you shared an elevator with or someone you shared a shuttle bus with to the venue uh, was judged to be... Um, have tested positive for COVID, then you are also, you're participating in the Olympics. This lifelong dream is in jeopardy. That's so tough, Stephen. Uh, you know, the, these organizers have a really tough challenge balancing public safety, public health concerns with Olympic dreams, which, you know, that, that's, a, that's a really tough decision to make. And um, my, my hat goes off to them and I hope everyone stays safe. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about how it might impact the dynamics, you know, pre-race, lining up, the stands. What's it going to look and feel like there in Adaiba Marine Park? 
Well, for marathon swimmers, again, most marathon swimmers, Quinn, as you and I know, um, we don't really see or hear people cheering us on. It could be a channel swim or it can be a FINA international uh, marathon swimming competition. Really, it isn't like a basketball game. It isn't like um, uh, gymnastics or beach volleyball where you have crowds that you can hear and you can feel. Um, swimmers are way out in uh, Daiba Marine Park, which is in the middle of Tokyo Bay. Um, even if there were 10,000 people there, 20,000 people there, you know, the swimmers can't really see or feel them. Um, and what will happen is they'll just swim as they normally do. So the, the lack of spectators for marathon swimming, yeah, that's not going to really affect the race at all. Got it. Got it. Okay. So a small factor there. Okay, Stephen, why don't we talk about the course design? So we can actually see it in the image just below us right here. And uh, what, are we, what are we looking at? Walk us through this, uh, this course outline. Okay, so uh, every Olympics uh, chooses its, its, marine, its uh, 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 marathon swimming venue differently. In um, Beijing, it was in a rectangular uh, rowing basin. So it was four loops, four equidistance uh, uh, loops. Or, or rectangles, actually. Um, in the Serpentine, which is an oddly shaped lake, they had to fix, they had to, they had to jury rig, if you will. They had to, they had to overlay uh, a course in this oddly shaped uh, lake, which they did. It was great. Um, it was also fun because they had thousands, tens of thousands of people lining the shores of the lake, and, and the athletes saw them. The, the spectators could actually... Um, were relatively close to the swimmers. Now, the swimmers weren't necessarily paying attention to the spectators, but the spectators saw all of the movements and all of the tactics of the swimmers. So that was great. In the case of Coca Cabana Beach, they were well off of the shoreline and um, people were lining the shore of Coca Cabana Beach, but really they were too far away to make any, any real impact. In Tokyo, uh, Tokyo Bay, they actually, as you can see in the, the illustration, they fit a, a rectangle of sorts in, inside the bay and they made it seven loops. Well, we've never actually had seven loops in an Olympic race. We've had four, we've had five, six, whatever, but we've never had seven. That means seven loops or seven laps means it, if you look at the red dots at the edges of that uh, rectangle, those are big turn buoys. So all of the athletes have to go around that turn buoy at the same time. Well, you're going to have people on the inside, you're going to have people in the middle, and you're going to have people on the outside. Every single one of those is, is a factor. I mean, it, if we take the start of the race, which is in the, you know, the right-hand side of the course, and they shoot off the gun. There's 25 athletes who dive into a marine uh, park. They're literally sprinting 200 meters before they have to take a hard left 90 degree turn. Quinn, you and I have been in races and you know when you have 25 people, 25 guys trying to sprint 200 meters and then make a hard left turn, there's going to be conflict. There's going to be contact. There's going to be elbows, knees, uh, people are going to hit each other. And then you go, you know, you go down a stretch, then you get to the left side of the course, and you've got even a shorter period. So you've got a hard 90 degree turn, followed by another hard uh, 90 degree turn within basically a mi minute in a, in a bit. Um, that's tough. That's really tough. And you do that seven times. Um, and what's really interesting, this course reminds me of the Beijing Olympic course, which was similar to this. But you see, let's say we've already gone seven loops and we're on our seventh loop. And we finish the last turn buoy, which is on our left side, bottom left side. Well, now six times you've been swimming your guts out and you've been going straight toward the feeding station, for, toward the start pontoon. And then all of a sudden, on this after six exact um, swimming tangents, you have to go probably a 10 degree turn. 
Now, in Beijing Olympics, this actually led to Martin van der Weijen winning the gold medal. There were two swimmers who were ahead of him, and they went slightly off course. Martin actually took a perfect beeline, and he beat、uh, you know David Davies of the UK and Thomas Lures of Germany. So it may be in the heat, in this battle that will be nearly two hours. Um, and the athletes swimming all out. That you know, it after an hour and fifty minutes, you may not be thinking clearly. And we say, well, you just swim straight. Well, that's easy for us to say. But after an hour and fifty minutes in the heat, where you know your 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 heart is pumping, your your lungs are screaming, your your muscles are in pain, your stomach actually feels like you could throw up because you're just pushing yourself so hard. Um, your vision starts to go, and you know a, a difference of ten degrees. Literally, when races come down to tenths of a second, is a really, really critical part of this course. That's a great point, Stephen. And you know what? What a lot of folks may not understand who haven't swum open water is, you know, it might take a couple looks up to be able to identify the exact point where you're going. It's not super intuitive when you're on land. You know, visibility is great, but when you're really low in that water, trying to catch a glance and maintain a straight line, it's a it's a really acquired skill. And like you said, with these kind of conditions, it may may add to that difficulty level. Really interesting. So, so Stephen, let's take a step、oh, back wait, and、um, let me just add one point. Just yeah, of course.、So、can understand this. Let's say you and I were running a marathon race. Well, roughly. Your eye level is about nearly two meters, depending on how, how tall you are. Two meters from the surface of the ground, and so you're looking at a perspective from two meters in height to the finish line. Now imagine you and I were running against each other, and literally our eyes were one centimeter <laughs> from the ground.、Yeah. We could not judge where to go. And so when people say, "Well, why don't you swim straight?" Well, when swimmers, you know, are looking, you know, this far above the surface of the water, your perception and your depth perception is very, very difficult. That's a great analogy. I've never thought about it that way, but you're a hundred percent right. So, Stephen, let's talk about、uh, the rules. You know, I mean, I think this is—it's、uh, a relatively new sport to the Olympics. A lot of folks are used to watching pool swimming. It's pretty straightforward, except for you know maybe you know breaststroke and two hand touches、um, and underwater dolphin kicks. There's some nuances there,、um, but by and large, it's it's pretty straightforward. What are the rules of open water swimming? On paper, on paper, the rules are straightforward. They're basically two rules. One is unsportsmanlike conduct, and one is impeding. Uh, unsportsmanlike conduct is what you would expect. You can't punch anybody. You can't grab their ankle and pull them back. You can't elbow them.、Uh, you know you can't come over the top of them and pull on their shoulder or their arm or any appendage. That we sort of understand that. Now that being said, that happens around the turn buoys. Around the、uh, feeding station, it just happens. You can't get twenty-five men and women around a very small area and not have people, you know,、uh, hit each other, kick each other, go over each other. That's just the fact of life. So, the unsportsmanlike conduct is really more、uh, okay. It's there, and we don't want you to hit anybody, but we know you 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 are. Now there's two interpretations of that unsportsmanlike conduct. One is unintentional, and one is intentional. And the judges, the referees on the race course, have complete、um, jurisdiction authority to make that judge. So let's say you and I were rounding the buoy, someone ran into you, you stop momentarily, do a little bit of treading water, and then restart by pushing the water. As you push the water, you may kick me in the head. You may kick me in my torso, which really impacts me. And that actually happened to an American, Mark Workington, around the last turn buoy in the Beijing Olympics. He was hit hard. He was kicked hard, really hard. It actually took the wind out of him, and and it it impacted his finish in the race. 
But that was an unintentional action. A judge will not give you a yellow card or red card with an unintentional action. Now, let's say you and I were going around at the last turn boy and you looked back at me and you raised up your leg and you cold cocked me in the head. Well, that's clearly intentional and the referee would give you a red card for that. So the first rule is unsportsmanlike conduct. Again, there's two interpretations, intentional and unintentional, and that is up to the purview of the race official who are on boats um, very close to the swimmer. The second rule is even more difficult to, to, to determine. And, and really, we have the best and the most experienced judges at the Olympics as our head referee and assistant referee, and they're on the boat, they understand this sport very well. And that rule is impeding. In other words, if I am swimming straight ahead of me, and you impede my progress, in other words, you, you, you make me slow down, or you make me swim off my intended course, then that is an infraction of the rule. Now, you and I will be swimming very, very uh, competitively, uh, against one another, you and I will be swimming stroke to stroke. But let's say you want to go five degrees to the right. And I want to go five degrees to the left. Well, we're going to have some kind of conflict. And now it's the it's the purview of the referee to say what happened? Was I at fault? Or were you at fault? In general, in general, if I am a little bit ahead of you, it's very much like boating. I have the right of way. So if I'm slightly ahead of you and you impede me, maybe you veer into me or you try to push me off my intended line, then you are uh, judged to be in infraction of the rule. Now, in the rules, you get two yellow cards and you're out of the race. So in other words, you get one yellow card. On your second yellow card, you are di disqualified uh, from the race or you just get an immediate red card and you're immediately disqualified from the race. Okay, that sounds, that sounds nice, but in reality, it's a difficult thing to do because typically in a race, the swimmers are swimming so hard, they either intentionally or unintentionally ignore the designation of a red card. <laughs> So in other words, the swimmers don't know they're red carded until the end of the race. Now, the rules state that once you're red carded, you're supposed to leave the field of play. But in reality, you know, some, some athletes do, but in reality, they typically find out they're red carded after the race is over. So imagine this, imagine playing basketball and someone fouls out, but they continue to play. Now, in marathon swimming, there's no consequence to that. The only consequence is if that person who's already red carded has impeded the progress of a swimmer who still is eligible to swim. Well, the poor man or woman is prevented from swimming their best by a person who should be kicked out of the sport or should be kicked out of the race. So, you know, in open water swimming, we don't have instant replay. Um, the referees, you know, are human. They only, they can only see what they can see. They can only judge what they see. So in other words, a referee cannot say, I think he pulled them back. I didn't see it, but I think he pulled that. I'm going to give him a red card or a yellow card. That doesn't happen. They literally have to see it with their eye. And that's really difficult when you have 25 people literally swimming on top of one another. Wow. So it sounds like there's a lot of room for subjectivity. And it also sounds like there's some, um, some real consequences to having someone get a red card and then stay in the race uh, because they could continue to commit infractions and impact other swimmers who are still eligible. Um, that does sound a little problematic, but I have to say, if I'm a coach and I'm advising my athlete, um, you know, I, I've heard of multiple instances where you can uh, challenge a call. And, you know, maybe calls are overturned. So do you think that these coaches are advising their swimmers that if they think they uh, receive a red card, that they should continue to swim? Uh, I think uh, that is a possibility. It's also what the athlete himself or herself believe. 
Um, and you do have, in the case of any FINA sanctioned um, or FINA or I IOC sanctioned race, you do have the ability to um, a protest the call. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's always after the case. Um, you know, in the Olympics, we're, it, it's really unusual because the whole race is very well covered by video, very well covered. Um, you know, we're watching a game of basketball or a game of soccer, uh, you know, game of baseball, whatever it is. And we always have the benefit of watching a controversial play on the replay. That just doesn't exist in open water swimming because it already happened. It's in the past and the swimmers have moved on. And so, you know, swimmers know this, coaches know this. So it's full speed ahead, you know, uh, just keep on go go through the finish. I mean, we saw in the last Olympics in Rio de Janeiro, you know, uh, 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 what's it? Uh, Muller actually, the French uh, woman actually went over the back of uh, Rachel Bruni of Italy um, on the last stroke of the of the ten k race. So she had gone nine thousand nine hundred and ninety nine meters. The last stroke, the last meter, she was given a red card and disqualified. That made Pollyanna Okimoto jump from fourth to suddenly a bronze medal winner. So stranger things had happened. And I suspect in this very tight course, you know, strange, controversial things will happen. All right. So for this last segment, Stephen, I want to I wanna walk us through the race from start to finish and I want you to talk about, you know, the, the setup and, um, you know, the organization of, of the race and the course and the format, uh, but also about the tactics and strategies used. So let's start with the start. So how, how are they lined up? Are they diving in? Um, where are they starting from? Yes. So they, uh, there's, a, there's a floating pontoon and they line up a number one to number 25. Those are randomly selected at a, a uh, pre-race technical meeting. And so you don't know if um, you're gonna be standing next to the German swimmer or the swimmer from Algeria. You just don't know. Um, and to be honest, uh, they try to keep it as, as I would say, as, as fair as possible. But here you have a 10K race from the starting pontoon to the first 90 degree turn, you've got a 200 meter distance. That means, you know, if you're on a little bit on the outside, you know, you may that it may be 200 meters. Yes, exactly to the buoy, but your angle is not so good. Personally, I would like to be on the outside because you could always squeeze in. Think about if you're, you've got 11 guys to your left, 13 guys or 12 guys to your right, and they're all going swimming to a point, you know, Everybody is that. So that first 200 meters is going to look like a literally a 200 meter sprint to a buoy. Um, there's no if, ands, or buts. There may be someone like Ferry Workman who is so savvy, so strategic. He may just say, you know what? I got 9.8 kilometers to catch up for a gold medal and I'm just going to kick back for a while. But you know, in this race, when it comes down to tenths of a second, um, that's a very major decision that he and his coaches will have to make. Interesting. So you, you touched on that, uh, that pace right off the bat. That's going to be, I imagine ferocious, especially with that first turn buoy coming so quickly, but let's talk a little bit more about pacing generally um, and maybe some of the differences. What should we be watching for as these swimmers jockey for a position in you know, the first through the seventh lap of this event? Well, I, I think this course, I think the race is going to be fast, very fast, the fastest in history, despite the warm, work, murky waters. Um, just the quality of swimmers, uh, quadrennial by quadrennial improves. We've got real distance quality athletes here, and they're just going to push each other. Um, so the race is going to start out fast, probably, I would say, one or two loops in. Uh, the leaders are going to dial back a bit uh, because you just can't maintain a sprint for over a half an hour with an hour and a half to go. Uh, they're going to have to slow down a bit. And that's where guys like, let's say, Ferry Wortman, 
he may casually go to the first 200 meters and he knows that around lap two or three, he can gr gradually weave his way up toward the front. Now, weaving his way up toward the front is risky. He does have to expend a lot of energy in the beginning. Uh, let's say, uh, Quinn, you and I, let's say um, we were going 10 100s or 1,000. I sprinted out just and I was a body and I was at 25 yards ahead of you. And then I just dialed back. Meanwhile, you are, are, are sprinting as hard as you can to catch up to me. Well, by the time you catch up to me, I'm actually nicely, you know, I'm rested, I'm ready to go. So at any which way you look at it, um, there's a tactic involved and there's overall strategy involved and you got to be comfortable in your decision because one major, um, bad decision in this race will cost you a medal. Yep. yep. That makes sense. So Stephen, one of the, the biggest components of open water swimming, especially for people uh, used to watching pool swimming on television is uh, drafting. Why don't, why don't you talk to us about, um, you know, some of the tactics used to optimize drafting and maybe just explain a little bit about what drafting is and how it's going to play a role in this race. Yeah, people know drafting or slipstreaming uh, from the automobile racing world and the cycling world where, you know, if you're, you're in a Peloton in a, um, in a bike race in like Tour de France, you just sort of tuck behind the, the cyclist ahead of you. Or if you're in a car race, you, you tuck behind the uh, car ahead of you and it breaks the wind resistance. Um, and water is a he much heavier medium than, than air. And so you want that person ahead of you to be, quote, breaking the water. Uh, the water is actually literally moving forward and you're caught in their wake, which is helping you swim at their same speed with less exertion of energy. And so uh, drafting is a major, major part of this event. Um, everybody will be drafting somebody at some point in this race, um, ideally, you want to be uh, swimming, depending on how fast you're going, somewhere between your hip and your knee. Uh, quite often, people say the best place to be is right behind you. Uh, I don't believe that's the case. A, we've seen through data that uh, drafting off of the hips within that sort of break water or that, that wake of the swimmers is the best thing to do. And plus, if you're swimming directly behind someone in, in this murky water, you're going to have to lift up your head to see where that swimmer ahead of you is going, or you're gonna to have to slightly touch their toes. You slightly touch your toes, and they're gonna kick your hand very hard. You know, that, that you don't wanna have any physicality if you want, if you can avoid it, and that's a very good way to get the person ahead of you really upset, because the most savvy swimmers know around that turn buoy, they know exactly who's behind them. And they, all they have to do is slightly slow up a little bit. I mean, just a smidge, a tad. And all of a sudden, that person behind them is just clocked with a kick. <laughs> so that, that brings up a good point, Stephen. The, the turns, there are so many turns. There are 48 turns in this seven-loop course. Um, that, that seems to me like it radically impacts um, the dynamics of this race. I mean, it's a massive bottleneck, which we touched on. You have all these people coming around. What, what are some of the tactics used to get around that turn buoy more efficiently um, and gain a little bit of ground on your competitors? Yeah. Um, you know, I wish I would have uh, been smarter in math. I just realized that uh, it's a seven loop course with four <laughs> buoy turns. So that's 28, not 40. 28, 28. Yeah. Um, now, there are, if you look at the course, there are intermediate buoys, and those are those lightly shaded uh, areas of gray. Uh, those are also buoys, but those are intermediate buoys. You can go on either side of them. On the red buoys, the turn buoys, you have to keep your right shoulder, uh, I'm sorry, your left shoulder around them. So, you know, there are 28 buoys. It's very, very tight. And just like a cyclist or runner in an indoor track or, um, uh, you know, a racer in, in let's say, Formula uh, uh, One racing or the Indianapolis 500, wherever you may be, you know, do you take the inside or you, do you swing out widely? 
Um, those are two different tactics. Uh, there may be a athletes who more prefer the inside track. There be some athletes who prefer the outside track, some in the middle. And guess what? Their tactics will change as the packs themselves morph into different um, uh, shapes and sizes. Got it. Good to know. So the next element of this sport, a little unique, is, is feeding. And, you know, we've all watched uh, road races and you just grab the grab the Gatorade as you run by, and it's, it's a pretty seamless process, but it's a little different in swimming. Why don't you talk to us about uh, what the feeding stations look like and some of the strategies involved in that? Personally, I think the feeding stations are amongst the most scenic parts of marathon swimming at, the, at this highest level. You have a bunch of coaches, one coach per athlete with these long feeding sticks. Um, they can't be uh, longer than... Um, I think it's, uh, is it two meters? Yeah, two meters. Uh, and uh, they're just basically poles that have, let's say, water bottles or um, some kind of gel packs uh, at the end. The athletes swim by the um, feeding stations, then they grab their water bottle or they grab their, their goo or their, you know, their gels and suck it down within seconds. Um, now, this is an interesting rule um, in 2016, Anna Marcella Kunha had to swim her entire race without any hydration, any feeding. Evidently, every time she went by, her feeding stick was either hit or dropped or what have you. And guess what? There's no consequence to that action. It was an unintended, somebody knocked her water bottle out and she couldn't find it. So, you know, even you can have, un, you know, fate can intervene and you can be very unlucky. All of a sudden you're waiting, you're so thirsty. I got to get somebody to drink. You pass by the feeding station and there's no water in your water bottle. There's no bottle in your feeding stick and your coach is waving you on saying, hey, I'll get you next time. That is really, really uh, a, a major bummer. <laughs> that sounds tough. So Stephen, given that there are seven loops to this course, um, swimmers have the option to feed on every single lap. Uh, but I, I know from experience, they probably won't. So given the conditions, the heat, how frequently do you expect uh, most swimmers to, to stop and feed? I think out of the, the five loops, they'll probably stop uh, a minimum of four times and a maximum of six times. Um, I, 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 six times is even a lot. Um, you know, they're, they're all going to be very, very, very well hydrated before. Um, you know, they're, 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 because of the heat and humidity, the IOC determined the start of the race will be very early, extremely early. The sun rises in Tokyo in summer, you know, close to 4 a.m. Uh, and so it's going to be a very, very early start trying to, it, they, they can't do it when it's dark, but they do want it to have the race finish before the sun is too high in the sky. And so the race is going to start early. The swimmers are going to be very well hydrated. And so they'll probably skip the first loop. They may even skip the second loop, but they're going to have to hydrate um, and do something for a race that will be nearly two hours. So, um, you know, I, three, four is probably, um, what they'll take. They'll stop, but they also have gel packs. Now, personally, um, a gel pack, you know, these, these, these packets of, of gel, they sort of sit in, in your stomach. Now, all these swimmers are very familiar and acclimated to taking gel packs, but when it's this warm at 31, 32, 33 degrees Celsius water and with high humidity, even if it's early in the morning. I don't know how a coffee gel will sit that well when your body's that hot. Yeah, that'll be interesting. And, and Stephen, are these guys tucking uh, gel packs into their suits and as, as kind of a, a backup? Is that right. how they approach it? Yes, yes, they will all do that. So you'll see, um, especially the guys who, who wear jammers, so that means they only go uh, to their waist and, and then down down to their leg. Um, they'll have the gel pack stuck in the back of their suit. Uh, women will, will do, will put it in various places. Um, 
you know, uh, some, some of them have behind their shoulders or uh, their shoulder blades, some um, on the bottom of their uh, suit. So where their suit ends uh, at maybe mid thigh or closer to their knee, they'll stick it in there. And so um, they almost 100% of the athletes have this backup. Um, in this race, I don't know how many times we'll see uh, the athletes stop to, um, and, and it's good to have them, your backup. You can take your backup gel any point of the race. So you don't have to waste time at, at the feeding station, you know, where, when 24 other people are there, you could take it at, at your own convenience. And, and I think some, some athletes will. Got it. Got it. So we touched on this a little bit, uh, but I want to talk more about the physicality. I mean, this, this is a contact sport. We went over the rules and, um, but within that, there's an expectation that there will be physical contact. And I know, Stephen, you have a little bit of a water polo background, so you're familiar with, um, with what, that, what that feels like. Tell us, you know, what, what, how are these people, how are these athletes approaching this swim? Um, and, and, you know, what can they expect? I mean, are, are they prepared to get an elbow in the face and the chest? Are they you know, intentionally or quasi-intentionally um, going to try to gain an advantage with um, uh, maybe swimming over someone's legs? Like how, how much contact is there really? A lot. <laughs> they are fully, every single one of the athletes fully expects that it's going to be a pretty brutal swim. Um, imagine in a, if Michael Phelps had to swim with two guys in his same lane, butterfly, <laughs> there will be conflict. They, it, it's, it's a given. If, if you're an Olympic boxer, you're going to get hit and you're going to have to hit. That's the mentality of these athletes. It, it's par for the course. It's, it's nothing to shy away from. It's nothing to complain about. It just is. Um, now, you know, nobody likes to, uh, I remember in the uh, 2008 Olympic qualifier, uh, a swimmer, uh, Chad Ho, he actually got kicked in the goggle and his goggle shattered. His cornea was torn. After that race, he had to be in, uh, isolated in a dark room, just being very still for, I think, two or three weeks as his, his uh, cornea repaired. So these things happen. Um, we've had American swimmers with broken ribs, chipped teeth, uh, cheap chipped tooth. Um, so, you know, physicality is a real thing, but that's what they've signed up for. Yep. Nobody wants to get hit. Nobody, uh, arms are locked, you know, um, uh, you know, people hit, uh, their hands. It, it, you know, the, the real key for, we see the best swimmers are they expect it and they ignore it and they don't retaliate. If you get so angry at your competitor that you are focusing your energy on re retaliating against that person, well, he hit me, I'm gonna hit him back. That's actually taking away from your success. Yep, yep, that's good. That's the right mental approach. So Steven, finally, the finish. So in pool swimming, we have touch pads and you touch the wall first and it's very clear if you win by a hundred or a second, um, marathon running, you know, you cross the, the tape and you break the tape and there's a photo finish. How does it work with uh, marathon swimming? I mean, it's amazing to me over this, you know, effectively two hour 10 K race, um, how close these finishes really are. So what, what are the mechanics of finishing? And uh, maybe tell us a little bit about some of the interesting examples that we've seen in, in recent history. Yeah. So the race uh, finishes at a uh, finish uh, touch pad that's elevated above the water surface. So people are wondering, well, why don't you have the, the touch pad in the water like you have with pool swimming? Well, if you did that, you'd literally have a crash. You'd have the first swimmer finish, the second person pile up against him, and you would literally have very injured people. And so what they do is you have this touch pad that's elevated above the surface of the water. You touch the touch pad, and then you swim through the finish. 
Now, even if you cross the plane of the finish line, that doesn't mean you actually finish the race first or even finish the race. You need to touch the touchpad. That has to be a fact. And, and there are judges on either side of the finish with three cameras, uh, what do they call them? High definition cameras that capture all of this. And so it, once you touch, then you get your official time. Now, what's a really interesting part of marathon swimming is Omega timing, which is the, you know, timing system of the Olympics. Um, we, we see a close race, like when Michael Phelps won that famous 100 meter um, butterfly race against Michael Kavik in, in 2008 by one one hundredth of a second. You know, the finish was there. Everybody looked up at the finish board and Michael Phelps won by one one hundredth. We didn't actually question it okay, he won by one one hundredth. And many of those races have happened before in the pool. In the open water, it doesn't matter. It does not matter what the timing says. It's entirely up to the eyeballs and the judgment calls of the Finnish judges to determine who finished first or second. It is that close. And so many times throughout open water swimming history, it's been so close that the judges have replayed and replayed and replayed the tape of the finish line because it's literally a photo finish. And the judges are looking at this, the same judges in the same room and going, well, swimmer A won that one, but did he really? Was it swimmer B? And that's why now the sport is, has evolved to have cameras located to different points. So we have different angles of who actually did touch the touchpad first. Wow. That's amazing. Well, do we expect to see uh, some close finishes in, in Tokyo, Stephen? One, there's 25 women, 25 men. There will be a close finish from one to 25. <laughs> guaranteed. Great. Well, it's going to be fun to watch, Stephen. Thank you so much for your time. And uh, we encourage everyone to watch our profiles of the 25 men and 25 women uh, and Stephen's very bold predictions for who's going to come out on top and who's going to be 25th. So we look forward to that. Thank you. Thanks, Stephen.